Why go to church? I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. How many of you have heard that from someone? Okay, it's a common thing we hear nowadays. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I can worship God out in the woods. Or I don't want to be a part of some organized religion. Uh, common things we hear about church and going to church. But we have to remember to follow Christ is to be in the Father's house. It's one major part of being a Christian, what it means to be a Christian. So let's look at this Luke 2 passage in a little bit more detail and see what it says about going to church. Um, you encourage you to follow along on the outline. It's on the back of the worship outline there. And uh, I need you to follow along in the outline tonight because you're going to have to fill in one blank for sure at the bottom. Okay? So encourage everybody to pull it out and uh, turn, there, turn there down now. So first we see Jesus' parents were about going to the Father's house. Um, we see in Luke 2, 41, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. So every year they had to go to Jerusalem, about 80 miles away from Nazareth, to uh, the festival of the Passover. The Old Testament required that uh, the Jews went three times a year to Jerusalem, but by the time it was the first century, by the time Jesus was born, pretty much the Jews were just going once a year, mainly because of the distance. Uh, they were going for the Passover, remembering when God took them out of Egypt, out of slavery, and freed them, and eventually gave them the promised land. Um, how many Christians today do you think would go 80 miles every single year for sure to worship? Now, 80 miles today doesn't sound like that big a deal, right? It's from here to say, Sturgeon Bay. But what if they had to walk about three days? How many Christians would be committed to walking every single year, three days away, three days back, to go to church? Or, if we want to think about it in our driving uh, mentality, where do we go that takes about three days of driving? California, right? Uh, how many Christians, if God commanded that we go to California from Wisconsin every single year for a worship service? How many Christians would be committed to doing that? This just gives you a little bit perspective of a perspective of how big of a commitment this was for Mary and Joseph and Jesus to go to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. Now it's pretty interesting that Mary is along as is along as well. Because according to the Old Testament, only the father was required to go to this festival every year. And once the son turned 12, which is what Jesus is uh, in this story, the son is uh, required to go along as well. And during the Passover, they have special instructions for those young sons, kind of a teenager uh, youth group, uh, where they're teaching them. Uh, I'm sure it's not as many games as we have today. Uh, they're teaching them the Old Testament law. And so that's why Jesus is there. But all of a sudden, he's starting to ask them questions, and uh, not really questions that he really is wondering about. <laughs> he's kind of challenging them on some things. But do your children know the priority of being in the Father's house as Jesus did? Obviously, if they're willing to go three days every single year for the Passover, worship at the local synagogue in Nazareth is very much a priority. They're raising Jesus as a faithful Jew. So we hear Jesus' parents we're about going to the Father's house. And then Jesus was about going to the Father's house. 
Luke 2, 49. Why were you searching for me? He asked them. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? So, now most of us, when we hear this story, how in the world did they leave Jesus in Jerusalem, right? How many of you asked that question? Okay, how did they leave Jesus in Jerusalem? Okay, nobody, you guys all left your kids at Walmart wandering someday or uh, at some big festival or whatever. You forgot them, uh, so you're used to that. But yeah, it's, it makes sense when we understand that they traveled in large groups. They traveled as families, you know, and uh, they were, you know, it's not 2015. So there was safety in the neighborhood. There was safety in Jerusalem. There was safety in Nazareth. They didn't need to have those little leashes on their toddlers with a backpack, you know, tying them to mom and dad. Um, they're pretty confident. Jesus is with all the other cousins, aunts and uncles. They all walk together to Jerusalem. So when they go to leave, they assume Jesus is with the mob of people walking back uh, to Nazareth. So that's why it makes it, when you know that context, it makes a little more sense that they would discover a day or two into the journey back home, Jesus is not there. But then it gets kind of funny when you see Jesus' response. Now, mom and dad, why would it take you three days to find me in Jerusalem? You should have known exactly where to go. Wouldn't you know, shouldn't you know, I would be in my father's house? Wouldn't you know, shouldn't that have been the first place you looked, I'd be at the father's house? Why did you look at the 7-Eleven? No, I'm not at the 7-Eleven. Why did you look at the toy section at Walmart? No, I wasn't there. I'm at the father's house. I'm in my father's house right where I belong. Jesus' parents are still trying to figure out what this raising the Messiah exactly means. And they're learning a little bit more. He was about being in the word. He was about studying the word of God. What if our teenagers were more about being in the word of God than uploading the latest video game? their iPad. Now I'm sure Jesus played some tunes as a 12 year old. But I just love this, this focus on being in the Word. Being in the Father's house. And then Luke chapter 2 says Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Can you say that about your kids if you still have kids at home. Are they growing in wisdom and favor with God? We know they're growing in stature, right? Everybody's growing. You can't stop that. But are they growing in wisdom and in favor with God? Jesus so showed perfect commitment to the Father's house when he died on the cross. Uh, he showed his commitment to the church. The church is us, right? The church, we've been talking about church as in, as in worship, but ultimately the church is us, the people of God, the followers of Jesus Christ. So in Ephesians 1, verse 7 and 8, where it says, in him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace, that he lavished on us, we can be reminded that Jesus perfectly fulfilled that law he was studying in the temple. And he was that perfect sacrifice so we could have forgiveness of sins. He was all about redeeming the church, the followers of Christ. So what do you think if you were to ask, talk to someone about worship, I think a lot of times, myself included over the years, I've had a hard time really answering that question. You don't have to be a Christian, or you don't have to go to worship to be a Christian. Uh, it's sometimes hard 
to come back uh, with a good response. Um, so gifts we receive in worship, being part of it, the Father's uh, Worship is good for our health, good for our relationships. Um, and Alvin Institute is actually a, a very reputable um, organization, research uh, company, and they do a lot of uh, church study uh, behavior of, of Christians. Some other things you can probably think of benefits of worship, but I think this is probably uh, the top four that probably jump to your mind. You hear the word of God, right? You're hearing God's truth being spoken into your life. Uh, I can't help but struggle with and be saddened by so many who take their life. Um, we're not in worship. Not in worship on a regular basis at all. We're not hearing God's truth being spoken in their life. The enemy is speaking all kinds of lies into their life. And they're not hearing God's love, God's truth into their life. Um, we receive the sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper, nourishment, food for our faith, uh, encouragement in our faith, just that daily food we need for our body, uh, spiritual food we receive in worship. And then fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, just uh, connecting with others uh, through worship. So I want to highlight three action steps for you for 2016. Um, one is just be in worship. Uh, many of you are excellent at that. Um, maybe some of you uh, could grow in that. Just being in worship, making it a part of a weekly habit. Number two, invite a person who's separated from the Father's house in worship. Here's where I want you to take a moment, grab a pencil or pen, uh, in the pockets in front of you, and I want you to write down a name. I want you to write down a name of someone who is not regular in worship. Okay, hold your pencils up. Let me see them. Yeah, you're just sitting there. Grab a pen. They're before you in the little thingamajiggy. We're all doing this. Okay. Some of you have parents who aren't in worship much because they don't drive anymore. And you come to worship every single week and they sit at home. Go get them. Bring them to worship. Some of you have kids you would love to be in worship. And writing down their name, you know it's just, you don't want it to be a battle. Well, then don't make it a battle. Just putting down their name, make it a prayer. An every single day prayer. And what I'm going to challenge you to do is to put this on your refrigerator um, with a magnet and leave it there staring you in the face. I'm going to do this as well. I have a neighbor I need to invite. I've invited him before, but it's been like a year and a half. I need to invite him again. And I'm going to have it stare me in the face until I do it. Pastor, Chad, you cannot take that slip of paper down. That's what I'm telling myself until I invite the neighbor who needs Jesus so badly. Um, who comes to your mind? friend, a neighbor, a co-worker, a relative, um, write down their name. Challenge yourself to bring them to worship this year. And what do you say to somebody who says, I don't need worship to be a Christian? This is my favorite thing to say, mostly because it worked on my neighbor in San Antonio, Texas, in our apartment complex. Okay, he said, I don't need to be a Christian to be, or messing that up. I know I need to go to church to be a Christian. I said, okay, you like the Dallas Cowboys, right? He said, yes, I do. You watch the Dallas Cowboys, right? Yes, I do. 
You read articles about the Dallas Cowboys, right? Yes. You go to games once in a while with the Dallas Cowboys? Yes. Okay, then your life is proving you're a Dallas Cowboy fan. Now in Wisconsin, this is gonna be easy because everybody's a Packer fan, right? Virtually, uh, maybe not everyone, Ray. Um, but uh, most sane people who live in Wisconsin are Packer fans. So you say, you're a Packer fan, right? Yes. Do you watch the Packers? Yes. Do you uh, listen to news reports about the Packers? A lot of people do. Some of them even religiously watch that Sunday night show or Monday night show, right? Um, with the coach and a player. Uh, they read articles. Some of them even get the Packers emails and newspaper and, you know, they got Packers stuff on their cars and in their bathrooms and in their basements and Packer glasses and blah, blah, blah. Their life proves they're a Packer fan. But is their life proving they're a Christian? It's a really easy parallel. If you watch the Packers on Sunday, it proves you're a Packer fan. If you go to worship on Sunday, it proves you're a Christian. You never go to worship. How do I know you're a Christian? People who are Packer fans read, uh, read articles about the Packers or um, you know, hear news reports about the Packers. People who are Christians read the Word of God. Are you reading the Word of God, Mr. or Mrs. Christian, who refuses to go to church? It's a good parallel. It's a good connection to make them think, hmm, maybe my life needs to follow uh, what I want to be, what I say I am. Obviously, as the pastor on the video at the beginning said, um, Christ followers, Christians, follow Christ. Christ went 80 miles to worship every single year in Jerusalem. And he went to his local synagogue. You can always use Hebrews 10.25. Don't give up meeting together as, as some are in the habit of doing. But be, be devoted to the word. You can use commandment one, love the Lord your God. Do you really love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength? Uh, as our song said, if you're not in worship. You can use the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That does not mean go skiing every Sunday. Not what that commandment is talking about. Uh, it's talking about being committed to the Lord, committed to a life of worship. I thank the Lord Jesus for his model to us, his model of commitment to worship. Being a Christian is all about basically following Christ, echoing his life. And so we commit to worship. Let's pray together.